All right, hello everybody, welcome. We'll get started in just a moment. I am turning my phone off here and I see there are people coming in. So welcome, get started in just a moment. Welcome back Loretta, hi Linda, Vicky. So glad you guys are back on. I see you come on every week, so I do greatly appreciate that. Kimmy's here, Bridget. And just again, making sure that my phone is off. Christopher's here and Anna's here. Alexandra. Great. So uh, tonight, um, we are going to be talking about how to cultivate an inner awareness of your body. But really, what I am mostly focused on is for you to understand the complexity of hunger and how to get a better handle on that so that you have your, your ability to make decisions regarding your food in the most efficient and sane way. See, we have a bunch of other people coming in. Hi, Cheryl and Marsha, welcome. So my goal, above everything that we're going to be talking about by the end of this class is for you to understand the complexity of hunger and how it impacts your choices of food. We think of it more as, well, we all know stress and makes a difference with hunger and you know we know sugar has some impact, but I wanna give you a more global feeling for it, that there are so many different things that impact it that a lot of times we think we're, we think we have it under control because we're making, we feel like we're making the right choices based on how we feel. But ultimately there are things potentially that could be thrown into the mix here that you're not even aware of that could be affecting your hunger. So I guess cultivating an inner awareness for hunger is really, or understanding hunger in a deeper way is really what this, what this class is about. Um, if anyone has any problems with the audio, definitely put it into the chat box, which is here. And I'll just type that in. And then we're going to bring up the mind map, like always. And we've got it up here and we'll make it bigger. And these are the things that we're going to be speaking about tonight. And they're not really in any particular order. I'm gonna blow this up a little and we'll just sort of, uh, I titled it, How to Cultivate an Inner Awareness of Hunger and Satiety, because that's really what we're going to focus on tonight. So even though I, I was thinking about how to order these before I came on tonight, but I, I really, think it doesn't make a whole lot of difference because we're going to be covering all of these. Now, let's just go through them briefly. We'll talk about the work of Stanley Schachter, who is a very, very influential psychologist who did all kinds of different studies on emotion and lots of, he was a very, very, uh, is a very well-known um, historically significant psychologist. And we're going to talk about one of his studies where he compared French and US college students. And I've mentioned it in one other lecture, but I can't remember the context of, of why I mentioned it. Might have been the true versus false hunger. We'll talk about what those two words mean. We'll talk about stress and hunger and get a little bit more in depth to, to what's going on there. Recognizing glycemic impacts, which is basically recognizing sugar, what, what elevations in blood sugar are going to be doing to your hunger. And you're going to see in, in a lot of these different things that insulin and sugar play a big role. What is important to understand is that insulin and blood sugar are a little more complicated than what the general conception of them are. And you'll get a better understanding of that as we go on. Sleep and hunger, light and hunger, movement and hunger. Uh, this I threw in there mainly because taste is important for satiety. And we'll talk about that, uh, about a specific study regarding taste and nutrient absorption. And then this is the last topic. And this I did include purposely last because I think it's the most impactful one for people to understand right off the bat 
that can make a significant practical change in your ability to control hunger, control weight, control food intake to a satisfying level, a healthy level, as opposed to a lot of the overeating we're doing now. And, and I mean, we're dealing with this crazy crisis as that is, I just can't even believe is happening. And I was on the internet looking at the food rankings on Amazon. Uh, this was around three weeks ago. And the number one food item on Amazon was a Nabisco snack box because people are retreating to comfort foods. And we'll talk a little bit about that when it comes to stress and hunger and why why that why that is not just not not from a psychological perspective but from a physical perspective there's an unfortunate association between between comfort foods and what they actually do so we'll we'll talk about that and that, and people are i think there was a headline said people retreating into comfort foods and we are in addition it's partly from the stress but because we want to feel this sort of comfort but unfortunately what that's going to do is it's going to perpetuate this problem with increasing hunger when you eat these foods, which is going to just compound the problem of people gaining weight and making poor food choices, feeling completely unable to have the strength to make the changes and to make the, the food limiting decisions that, that they need to make to maintain their health through this crazy, absolute craziness. So you'll see here, and there are other factors, but these are the ones that, I mean, this, this is more than enough to, to talk about on the, on the lecture tonight. So let's start with uh, Stanley Schachter. Now, Stanley Schachter in the 1960s did this really interesting study where he wanted to compare the cues that people had to stop eating. And they compared French college students to U.S. college students, and they did these surveys to see when, when, they would, when they would stop eating, and they would give them questionnaires to find out what that was. Now, the French university students, most of the, the responsive cues had to do with an internal feeling of being full. Now, the French are known to, be, to enjoy their food, to savor the flavor, to eat uh, around a table, of people with conversation where the food is not eaten in the same rapid pace that, that people eat in the United States. And most of the cues, again, were based on this internal sense of, of feeling full. And you would think, well, what other cues are there? Unfortunately, the college students reported cues like um, when the plate was, in other words, the question was, when do you decide to stop eating? So the, the French students said, you know, things like, well, I'm full, et cetera, internal cues. The U U.S. students said something like, one of the answers was when the television show is over, when the plate, the, the, when the plate is empty. So when we focus on relying on external cues, there's always going to be... Um, there's always going to be a problem with, with the cues that we have to, to stopping eating. So we need to pay more attention to how we're feeling when we're eating. And that's going to go, this is gonna loop into what we spoke, speak about at the very end, which I'm going to mention right now, that it does take time for the signals in the stomach to reach the brain. And if we are, we, we need to lengthen our time of observation. We'll get into more detail at the very end because I think that really ties things up quite, quite nicely. So, I mean, it is crazy to think that someone would say, and many Americans probably still do say, the studies were done in the 60s, probably still saying things like when, when the TV show is over, when the plate is, is empty. Okay, so now let's move on to true versus false hunger. Um, just finishing off the, this topic of in, internal cues, it's one of those things that need to be practiced. You can't just one day wake up and decide that you're going to 
um, achieve the ability to perceive some of these things because we have a lifetime of, of eating habits that a lot of times don't revolve on internal cues or they revolve around, oh, I'm stuffed, I can't eat anymore. And that is always not going to be the proper way of, of eating things. So the, as many of you know, there's this concept of blue zones where people live a long period of time. And in Okinawa, which is one of those blue, blue zones, one of, the, one of the customs there is to eat until you're 60% full and then stop. And that sort of contributes to, to longevity. But ultimately, paying attention to how we feel as we're eating, savoring the flavor, as we'll talk about later, makes a difference. Slowing down things so we give the time for the messages to reach the brain. Okay, let's go to true hunger and false hunger. Now, true and false hunger, this was two words uh, defined by a, a doctor by the name of Joel Furman. And what he was describing was when people, are, uh, when people are eating very, very cleanly, hunger is perceived very, very differently than when you are on roller coasters of blood sugar and insulin spikes. Um, the true hunger is experienced for people who do intermittent fasting or do periods of fasting. People, you, you can understand this difference. The difference is, is that when you feel hunger after a fast, it's very, very different from the hunger that you may have between your mid-snack afternoon snack and dinner time. The sensation of, of true hunger or what, he, what is really sort of like a healthy form of hunger is a sensation at the back of the throat, uh, sometimes just, just, this, just a, a feeling that you, need, that you need to have, that you want to eat something. Whereas false hunger, which sometimes can be a sign of, quite frankly, not having the metabolic flexibility in your body. Now, metabolic flexibility is this concept of being able to burn fat when you need to. And I believe these, these two things are tied up together. Now, if you don't have the ability to switch from burning sugar to burning fat, what happens is, is you are going to get these abnormal cravings that are a response of, of blood sugar spikes or super low blood sugar. When you have metabolic flexibility and you have the ability to switch from burning sugar to burning fat, you don't get this irregular mix of, of blood sugar spiking like that. So this concept of, of um, true versus false hunger is, is one to just sort of have an acknowledgement of that if you're feeling, if you feel sick and shaky and really just not feeling that well when you're hungry, that means that you might have a lifetime of potentially poor eating that has blunted your ability to be able to, to switch from burning sugar to burning fat. And one of the remedies for that is to get a better understanding of what your blood, blood sugar is doing, uh, looking at the glycemic load of some of the food that you're eating. You can look that up online. And trying to get control of your blood sugar it doesn't have to mean that you're diabetic, but we should all have an understanding of what's happening to our blood sugar because I'm sure many of you, myself included, have had situations where you eat something that is really high in sugar that you're not used to eating, and then a couple hours later, you're just ravenously hungry. And it's not the true hunger. It's like a ravenous hunger. You, you need to devour something like a wild animal. That is not normal. It's not the way, it's not just not normal. The nor true hunger or healthy hunger is really a, a, this sort of almost mental acknowledgement, oh, okay, yeah, I feel like I need to, need to eat something. Um, okay, let's move on to the next. Next is stress and hunger. And really, stress is, is motivated or mod modulated, I guess you could say, by, by two hormones. Epinephrine, which is adrenaline, which is that instant burst of energy that you get, when you're under stress, that actually blunts hunger. It's like if you're being chased by a lion, you know, you're not really thinking about 
your next meal. You just don't want to be, be someone else's next meal. So that's epinephrine. Now, long term, what happens is, is you start to get cortisol. And cortisol, is that's going to increase your hunger. And unfortunately, what happens is when you eat fat and sugar, um, that lowers the cortisol temporarily. So it makes you feel better. That's why comfort foods, partially why, comfort foods make you feel better. And you feel better, then it sort of in a bottle, your body almost says to you, communicates to you saying, saying okay, I feel better. The, the comfort food made me feel better. It lowered, you know, it's lowering your cortisol temporarily. And unfortunately, that's what happens. Unfortunately, as you can see, this, this creates this vicious cycle where you're go, gonna wanna go for another comfort food snack. And that's what we're dealing with. That's what a lot of people are, are dealing with um, these days. I, I have a, a um, puppy that's running around. That's why I keep looking because she was chewing on something. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Lucy. So, um, okay, so that's, that's what's happening with uh, fat and sugar. Now, I put in here that I would speak about balancing out your nervous system because I think that that is, <laughs> that is really important for understanding how to get out of this vicious cycle. And I have mentioned it on other lectures, and I'm putting it in here as well because it's so important. So you have, and I'll briefly say it because many of you have heard me say this before. So you have two, basically you have two wings of your immune system. You have what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response. And then you have your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and recharge part of your nervous system. Now, when you're when you're sympathetic, your fight or flight response is continuously being activated, then you're going to be subject to, to this. Now, normally during the day, you know, your sympathetic nervous system is more in control because you need, you need to work, you need to get things done. But one has to realize that, and we've spoken about cycles a lot, on, on previous classes, one has to realize that within the waking day, you need to be able to put in some parasympathetic activity. Now that can be reading a, a book, or reading a spiritual book, or something that's internally focused, could be taking a 20 minute nap or doing a 20 minute, uh, you know, uh, relaxed guided imagery exercise or a taking a bath, or oddly enough, sometimes just splashing cold water in your face can, can help to balance out your nervous system. Taking low, deep breaths and slow exhalations, that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And you need to be able to do this 15 to 20 minutes at least during active waking hours, uh, preferably more than that, maybe 20, 25 would be, would be great. And this creates another cycle in your active working day to be able to balance out the, the nervous system. So this is very, very important because we're all dealing with people retreating into comfort foods. And sometimes just having, doesn't help everyone, but sometimes having an intellectual understanding of what's going on can help you to make the choice to give you a little bit more energy or motivation to, to sort of stop this vicious cycle that's happening because I, I think like probably most of the country right now is dealing with, with this, unfortunately. And we really need to be careful and get out, get rid of all the comfort foods and find other ways to balance out your nervous system. Um, I know that's difficult for a lot of people, especially because they are cooped up with, with family members that they're not used to spending so much time with and not going out, but you need to be able to find some kind of small sanctuary place to spend 20 minutes a day to really balance this out. So, so important. Or else your hunger is going to be uncontrollable and you're not going to be able to have any control. My 
point in all of the all of the all this entire class is to understand that there are many different impacts to your hunger and unless you get a understanding or a grasp of them you're not going to be able to to get to get control over them okay all right so next is recognizing glycemic impacts so what this really is focusing on is the fact that anytime your blood sugar goes up and drops you're going to to get a hung you're going to feel hunger so white flour white sugar processed grains all of these things are going to raise your blood sugar more than it should so we've gone through this many times in past lectures and i think you're seeing how important i think it is for you to understand what's happening with your blood sugar not just because we have an epidemic of diabetes and pre-diabetes but even for people who are non-diabetic if they want to get control over their hunger which ultimately again means that you're capable of making the right decisions for yourself without being persuaded by these these signals that your body is sending if you're going to get control of that, that's, that's why this, this is going to be important to understand. Okay. And by the way, if anyone has any questions or comments, definitely uh, let me know. Okay. Next is sleep and hunger. So sleep is going to impact you in multiple lack of lack of sleep is going to impact you on many, many different levels. Uh, the first, oddly enough, is blood sugar. Just since we're talking about blood sugar, one night of sleep, of poor sleep, actually affects your blood sugar for up to 48 hours, meaning it's difficult to control, difficult to get as, as more, difficult to get a more a stable blood sugar when you haven't slept, slept that well. Now, the reasons all this is happening is partly due to the fact that you've just ruined your cycles, your circadian rhythm. And when you have that messed up, there are all kinds of signals in your body that are not going to be responding. Uh, we've spoken about previously that every organ in your body has a different cycle to it. And sleep is the great resetter of, of all the cycles in your body. And so when your sleep is messed up, the cycles in your pancreas and the cycles everywhere else are going to be impacted. And that's going to be, that's going to be a problem. On top of that, we can think of a third reason. A third reason would be that your parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system is offset. You didn't get a restful parasympathetic recharge during your sleep, and now you're going to need to um, get that fixed, get that rebalanced. So that's going to be very, very uh, important. So sleep is impacting you on many different levels. It's very important for you to um, it's very important for you to make sure that your hunger is really under control um, by getting, getting the proper, proper sleep. Okay, so now let's move over to light and hunger. And let's just do a time check. Let's see, okay, great. All right, let's put, let's put Miss Lucy down. Okay, now light and hunger is going to be, we can kind of come up with this without me even clicking on to the next thing because we've all already spoken about rhythms in the body. And if the rhythms in the body are messed up, sorry about that, Lucy. Uh, if the rhythms are messed up with, with light and hunger, then your circadian rhythms are going to be messed up. Potentially your sleep is going to be messed up. We know that blue light is going to interfere with your ability to fall asleep, um, but different colors have different impacts on, on that. So blue, green, and yellow light increase hunger. And is it, it's no wonder that when you think about it, when you think about food packaging as an example, um, bright colors, uh, in this case, you see a lot of red and green, yellow, because fruits and vegetables are naturally pigmented to stimulate our taste. You know, we want, it makes us want to try it. And same thing happens when you're exposed to these types of lights. They actually increase your hunger. 
gray light tends to decrease hunger. So you're not going to actually see many restaurants that, that have gray lighting, but you will see blue and, and different uh, colored lightings or color, I, I would say color, um, you know, uh, themes, I guess you could say, that are going to, to increase, increase hunger. But ultimately, when we are thinking about, in general, thinking about the, the circadian rhythms that, you know, we want to make sure that when we go to sleep, it's dark so that our circadian rhythms are not messed up. Obviously, many of you have read uh, it's sort of trendy now for some people to be wearing these blue blocker glasses at nighttime so that the signals are not going to interfere. The blue light is not going to interfere with your ability to fall asleep. And you'll see, I, maybe you haven't, but there's a lot of people who they call themselves body hackers and they wear these blue blocker sunglasses um, all the time. And they, um, and it's supposed to improve your ability to fall asleep when you avoid blue light. Now, blue light is, is from your cell phones, from TV screens, from you know, computer screens. They all release an enormous amount of blue light. And that's going to ultimately affect your hunger, which is going to ultimately affect your circadian rhythm and your ability to fall asleep. All of these things are impacting each other in so many different ways. So pay attention to the, the blue light exposure that you have. You probably shouldn't be watching any computer screens, you know, for a few hours before you go to sleep. You um, could buy blue blocker glasses. They're sort of orange, orange blockers, you know. Um, so that's one of the things that you can do. Okay, let's move on to movement and hunger. And there's some interesting studies, uh, but I'm going to. They revolve around this FOXA2 activity, which basically is insulin. Uh, and interestingly, this, this particular receptor is coded in both the liver and the hypothalamus, which is in the brain, and is responsible for movement. So what the, what the study showed was, and this is the author said, that the body needs fasting periods to stay healthy. Moreover, you should make sure you have a good body weight. He therefore doesn't think much of eating many little meals spread throughout the day. It's better to eat less frequently but well and leave room in between to get hungry. After all, because insulin is released during every meal, thus suppressing FOXA2, the motivation to do physical exercise and burn fat and burn sugar and fat visibly decreases. So we have another study, yet another study that's basically showing an additional impact on fasting, but in this case, when it comes to movement and an explanation why at some point, people who are obese, even animals that are obese, will you'll see a decrease in, in movement uh, at some point um, because of this. And anyone who's had a dog, um, when they're getting hungry and you put the bowl out, you know, you'll see an increase in activity and that's sort of a natural movement that, that happens. Unfortunately, when there's excessive obesity, you are, and high insulin levels, you're getting a situation where, um, unfortunately, there's a decreased motivation to move, to, to increase movement. And as a result of that, um, it just compounds things and people get more obese. All right, let's see if we can put it down. Okay. All right, moving right along. And we're getting closer to the uh, end of the lecture. I didn't think this one would last more than 45 minutes, um, unless we have, I see someone has asked a question. Let me pull that up, hold on. It's not letting me pull up, one moment. Let's see. Okay, I might have to get back to you on that question. Let's, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Vicky is asking, you may get to it, but I've heard that thirst can be confused as hunger. Definitely, can't, there's no question about it. A lot of times when people are dehydrated, they mistake it for, for hunger and they end up eating instead of, of, being, of drinking. 
And I, I tend to think that's more of a modern malady more than anything else. I think probably in the past people um, probably had a better distinction between the two. However, I will say when you look at animals and you look at, at uh, animals and how they hydrate, it's not always, there. there's this misconception that uh, that animals are getting the majority of their hydration from, from drinking water. But most of the time, depending on the animal, of course, most of the time they're, you know, animals like, like humans, traditionally speaking, got a lot of water from the food that they ate. And we'll talk, I have a lecture coming up about water, but this is a good place to put it in. You know, we are meant to get a good amount of hydration from the, the food that we eat. So um, high water content foods, fruits, vegetables, have a lot of water content. And it's really remarkable, but there is actually a difference in the water that is in fruits and vegetables than just drinking water. It has actually a different structure to the water. And we'll talk about what the difference between regular water from the tap and structured water is. But structured water, when you're, so when you're getting uh, hydration from food, you're getting it in a form that is a lot easier to, to, uh, to be absorbed and used by the body. When you get it from your food, it is being absorbed much slower in your body as well because a lot of the water absorption comes in your colon, which is all the way down your in intestines. That's Your colon is basically one of the main reasons it's there is to take water out of the food that is is in your, the, the food that you've eaten. And if you eat an, a lot of water, a lot of foods with water in them, your hydration is, is going to be much better. Not just because of the slow increase in hydration, but also because of this notion of structured water. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. And I'll be talking a lot about that later. One tip, however, I can say is that there are ways of, of structuring your water or getting water in, in food, food form. Uh, obviously miracle noodles are a fabulous way. Uh, and one of the, one, there was a, a very well-known doctor, I'm looking at one of her books or one of her books, but on my shelf. But when I spoke to her for the first time, I a big admirer of her for many years. She said, one of the reasons I love your product is because it's so hydrating. It's able to give you a good amount of water in the in this amazing food form of of water so i thought that was kind of <laughs> kind of an interesting thing one way is to take chia seeds and this is another way to which is a very filling way because it takes up a lot of space uh, we most of this lecture we've been speaking about hunger and not necessarily satiety but there's no question that when you eat a large volume of food that there are stretch receptors in your stomach that are going to make you feel full. So when you do something like one tablespoon, one tablespoon of chia seeds, and then put it in like, you know, um, like a mason jar like this, fill and just one, one tablespoon, and you let it sit for, you know, stir it up, let it sit for five to 10 minutes, preferably around 10 minutes, it will soak up the water. Uh, it'll be and then you just drink it down. And when you do that, not only does it provide a good amount of satiety, but it's also binding the water in such a way that it will be released very, very slowly over time. Um, so this is another way to, uh, one, get some essential fatty acids in you, and two, um, fiber, and three, like taking regular water and getting it in a nice form. So that, that's, that's really something that's, that's kind of cool. All right, so let's go back to the lecture. Definitely um, let me know if you have any further questions. And I'll, I'll keep, uh, oh, I think I, I think I see another question coming in. Uh, Cheryl's asking, a lot of fruit nowadays are GMOs and thus have a lot more sugar. It's getting difficult to find healthy fruit. What fruits do you like? Are there good are their fruits good for hydration without a ton of sugar? All fruits have a, a lot of sugar, even fruits like berries, which is really what I recommend, uh, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, all of which don't have a lot of sugar. 
um, those are, they, they have a lot of water. They're not as, you know, it's not like a watermelon. It's probably like 90 something percent water, but all fruits and vegetables have an enormously high amount of water content, which you can see really, because if you see a dehydrated vegetable, it basically turns into almost nothing. So, um, I'm not a big fan of tropical fruits, even though they probably have the most water in them. I think because of the, because just as you say, the sugar is an issue. So really the main thing is just fruits and vegetables. But if I had to recommend fruits, berries, berries are the way to go for sure. And lots of leafy green vegetables. So everyone should be eating a big, large amount of leafy green vegetables per day. Of course, we've spoken about that in other lectures, uh, notably the one on how to prepare your veg, how to prepare your plants a couple weeks ago, talking about how to learn to incorporate vegetables into your diet in a way. Some people say they're resistant or they're intolerant or they can't digest, et cetera, various different reasons. Part of the reason is because they haven't learned how to prepare them properly based on traditional means of preparation. So hope that answers your question. Um, Okay, very good. All right, let's get back to sharing my screen here. Okay, so now we move on to taste and nutrient absorption, which brings up the fact that we were speaking about, really, which is satiety. And there was this really, really, I think the word cool comes to mind when I think about this lecture. So they took uh, a bunch of Swedish women and a bunch of Thai women. And what they did was they created a Swedish meal and a Thai meal with the same amount of calories and vitamins in them. And one was Swedish, a dish, and one was a Thai dish. So they gave the Swedish food to the, first they gave the Swedish food to the Swedish women. And they measured the, the level of nutrient absorption that they got. And they did the same thing with the Thai women. The Thai women ate the Thai meal first. So the Swedish women ate the Swedish meal, the Thai women ate the Thai meal. And then they absorbed in their blood their, their vitamin counts. How much did they absorb from, these, from the meal? Then they switched it and they gave the Thai women a Swedish meal and the Swedish women, they gave a Thai meal. But remember now, both meals, the Swedish meal and the Thai meal have the same level of certain vitamins and minerals. And what happened is you would think, well, well, I don't know, maybe you would think something different. If you, what do you think happened in your mind? Well, the, the results showed that the Thai women absorbed more nutrients, even though there were the same amount of nutrients in the, in the Swedish meal. And it, so, Basically, uh, to sum it up, I think it's a cool study because it, what it shows is that there is a, some kind of signal that is going to be delivered to your body that is going to respond to a more tasty meal, which means that for all of you who are force feeding yourself kale salads that are gross, I'm not so sure you're absorbing what you think you may be absorbing. You really need to cultivate and learn how to make these things tasty and to make them enjoyable. One, because obviously you know that eating a salad that you don't like is never going to be sustainable. You need to learn to make that salad uh, as tasty as, as possible. You know it's not sustainable if you're just force feeding yourself a salad because I need to eat a salad or some other uh, reason beyond that. So, um, and, and two, what's amazing is that, that oh, I, forget, I forget what I was gonna say for two, but basically you have to make things taste good because there is a connection between your brain and your gut. There's a connection between your gut and your brain. These two things are constantly communicating to themselves. And if you don't like the food you're gonna eat, then you're not going to, to have the same level of satiety as well, when you eat something that is tasty and satisfying, then you are going to be a lot more full, satisfied and healthier because you're absorbing, absorbing nutrients. 
Okay. And then moving on to length, lengthening time of observation. You know, it occurred to me, it just occurred to me that it might be worthwhile that, you know, satiety is, there's a lot of work that's been done on satiety and the sensation of fullness. And it's very confusing research. I've read many, many studies trying to get a clear understanding of satiety because what's, what I found interesting is that when um, satiety is discussed in popular books on on diet and nutrition, I noticed many years ago that there aren't that many studies that are ever referenced. Because when you pull up the studies, there's all kinds of theories and philosophies on, on satiety, those that are, are from, that are, you know, various hormones that are related and very, various uh, physical aspects, you know, stretch receptors, and it's a very, very complicated topic. With a lot of different different opinions. You'll hear uh, vegans, the vegan community, say it, it, it's because of bulk and and fullness. And you know, you'll hear the sort of carnivore-like folks talk about, you know, how amino acids and protein is important for for satiety. You'll it's all over the board because research is so so complicated. And uh, it occurred to me that just a minute or two that, you know, that would be an, potentially an interesting aside to just go over the research there. But ultimately, now that I'm sort of talking about this out loud with you guys, I think it comes down to getting, we know all of these impact hunger. And I think that's more important because once we get a handle on hunger, I think satiety probably falls into place just fine if you're eating in a reasonable fashion. Because once you get your hunger under control, then I, I truly believe, you know, just sort of thinking about this in more depth, you know, on the fly here, I think that the confusion around satiety as a biochemical sense, you know, that we have is probably more related to banishing hunger or having abnormal hunger or, or the, whatever the case may be. All right, uh, looks like I have another question. Let me, um, let me check that out. Yeah, so Vicky uh, was saying, how about the stretching of the stomach or shrinking of it? Yeah, so that it, there's an impact there for sure. Uh, definitely an impact. Uh, but again, it's probably only one, only one impact. Okay, so lengthening time of observation. The, one of the first things I talked to with people, but I left it for, for the last thing. All of you have probably experienced the sensation that you were eating and you got interrupted, but at the time you got interrupted, you could have eaten another plate of fill in the blank. And maybe you had a phone call or something and you got taken away from the table. And then you come back 15, 20 minutes later and you're not that hungry anymore. I think all of us have had that experience. If you haven't, I urge you to do that Okinawa thing, get to 60% full at the table and then just take, go outside or get away from food for 15 to 20 minutes and just wait it out and see what happens to your hunger almost always you realize that you didn't need to continue eating because there is a delay. And this delay is, needs to be incorporated into our awareness. So we need to pay attention to the fact that the feeling of, of satisfaction is delayed by, it can be 15 to 20 minutes. I don't know if anyone is, I'm sure someone has done a study on that, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the time is, but I can tell you it is like 15 to 20 minutes. So eat 60%, you might be a little hungry still and just wait it off and see, and see how it goes. If you just did that, you'll probably be all that much more healthier. Um, and ultimately, I think that this is about putting in a space of observation anyway. 
because now, now, now we are so we're in such a crisis mode, all of us, that we are just moving, reacting, eating, just we're just in like this frenzied state. So this exercise of incorporating this waiting period can be incorporated across everything. Meaning you can incorporate a, a pause. You should create a pause before any sort of anything that you're, you're doing so that you can observe what's going on. But in this case, the important aspect is the fact that you need to wait it out for, for the sensation to, to reach your brain. And that's important. It's very, very important for you to understand that and to develop the skill. It's like a skill. You're learning more about your body. And maybe for you, it's five minutes or 10 minutes, but everyone has a delay. Um, and it's also responsible for the feeling of eating too much. You know, you ate, you ate, you ate, you ate. And then 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, I can't believe I ate all that because now you feel really, really full. So this delay is important to be aware of. Now, if we ate like we ate many, many in, in Europe, like in European cultures where they savor the food and they savor the relationships and they're putting their bodies, going back to the nervous system, they're putting their bodies into a parasympathetic state. You know, you don't want to eat when you're in a sympathetic state. It's like the equivalent of, as I said before, you're being chased by a lion, you're not going to want to eat. So here we are in this stressed state. When we sit down at the table, that is supposed to be a time for our nervous system to kick into rest and recharge and to nourish. And usually, and that's why ancient civilizations and cultures, and there's a long history in, in, in Europe, of course, as, as all of you know, of sitting around the table, having relaxing conversations, or at least expressing love with the people around us and the feeling of togetherness. All of these things activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Instead, we have people on their cell phones or the kids, you know, kids text messaging, and this is damaging to, to our health. And the reason it's damaging from a scientific perspective is it's keeping you in this sympathetic fight or flight reaction, which is going to affect everything from your perception of fullness to your ability to absorb nutrients to um, uh, you not having internal cues to, to stop eating. Uh, not being necessarily aware of what you're eating, not chewing your food properly. All of these things are going to impact your health. When you sit down at the table, especially at dinner time, that table um, is, is sacred. You know, in, in my tradition on Friday night, you know, the table is considered to be an altar. Um, and it, it's this holy, holy, supposed to represent, you know, sort of this holy altar and your, your frame of mind is supposed to get into that space as well. And we've sort of lost that. I know my father was telling me he had a friend who was Italian and um, the grandfather every Sunday, you know, they had a big family dinner and a lot of, a lot of um, second for second generation Italian families will have like a big family Sunday dinner and when the kids came into the house, he would collect all the cell phones. No one was allowed to, to have a cell phone at the table. And recovering some of that sort of ancient tra uh, cultural tradition of making the table and the act of eating sort of a sacred time is not just a quaint notion, really. It, is scientifically verifiable in the sense of your nervous system. And, and really, you know, food is one of the most intimate things that we do. It's, the, it's partly the way we interact with the world in the most intimate way. We take something from outside and put it in inside. And it's something that should be done with a sense of gratitude and reverence and and really a sense of what the miracle of, of this thing that we can take 
you know, an apple and be able to use it for, for energy and for um, sustenance. I, that's a, an amazing thing when you, when you sort of step back and you think about it. And in my tradition, every time we eat a certain type of food, there's a special blessing to say. But the, 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 the point of that whole exercise is not the blessing necessarily, but the fact that we're taking a step, a pause out of our day, a pause before we eat. And we're putting ourselves in a different frame of mind. We're distancing, distancing ourselves, sort of disidentifying or detaching slightly becoming aware of the act of the fact that we're going to be taking this food in and use, use the energy to you know, achieve what we want to achieve for the rest of the day. And this pause, as we were speaking about sort of lengthening this time of observation, this pause is really a remarkable pause. And because it's allowing you to enter into a different frame of mind for, for the food. And there's a, a famous quote I, by Viktor Frankl, I, I believe. And it, the quote is something like, um, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies freedom. That's, that's basically the quote, which basically means that we move all the time. Stimulus response, you know, this happens, we react. And there's no freedom there when we are constantly just reacting. So he says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space lies freedom, meaning when we're able to detach ourselves from stimulus and something from happening and its response, and we insert a space into that, that period, that's where we exercise our freedom. And I think everything that we spoke about here, honestly, is to put in almost like an intellectual space here to understand how hunger is impacted by so many different factors. And we can step aside and look at this. Hopefully, it allows each and every one of you to be able to see that you have a lot more control over your hunger by knowing these things and realizing before this point, before this class tonight, that you were being impacted by so many things in your environment and the way you eat that is make, was making it such that you were in a un, almost an uncontrollable state all the time, almost a stimulus response par, you know, paradigm is where you basically had hunger and then you reach for something. So hopefully what, I, what we hopefully have achieved tonight is that we have inserted this space between stimulus and response psychologically and physically that we can that we can achieve a matter a certain degree of freedom in making the decisions we need to make for for our health especially in these these crazy times all right so i see a couple questions so let me um go over there now and we will answer them okay uh vicky is asking from a visual cue and perspective, isn't the stomach about the size of our fist? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not that big. Yeah, it's probably around the size of our fist. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Yep. There's a whole lot of work that's actually been done on um, posture and gastric emptying. And... Um, I was reading some of that before I came online tonight, and the, there's a lot of varying opinions on, on the impact of posture, and it's, it didn't seem all that clear, but different postures affected gastric emptying, meaning at the food leaving the stomach and entering the small intestine. So there, was, there were some interesting things that were um, written about that, but I didn't think that it was definitive enough to include in the lecture. But ultimately, um, yeah, but from a visual cue and perspective, as Vicky is asking, the stomach is not really, is not huge, but it, it can stretch, it does have the ability to stretch. When you see a stomach, it's got folds in it that can, that can stretch. So, okay, well, uh, again, remarkably, I never think it's going to last an hour, but it ends up lasting an hour. <laughs> so, um, 
Alexandra, Anna, Bridget, Cheryl, Christopher, Kimmy, Lewis, Linda, Loretta, Marsha, Patricia, Vicki, awesome. It's so great that you are all here. I would like to especially say how um, grateful I am that many of you are coming on every week. That means that, at least I think it means that you are enjoying it and um, the fact that I could be of service here is, is really remarkable, but also you're helping me out by your questions because as I've stated before, each one of the lectures here, each class is going to be transcribed and then we're going to be putting this into a book format. So you're actually helping me to finish my first book. So that's really remarkable. And Loretta is saying to please invite Lucy again. <laughs> I will. Looks like she's taking a nap now. Okay, well, um, Vicky's saying very informative. Um, I love learning and sharing the info. Thank you, Christopher. I appreciate that. And that's a very nice thing to say. Uh, Christopher saying, we're the ones that need to thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you for saying that. Really do appreciate it greatly. All right. Well, I wish everyone, I know we're going through some crazy times and um, wish everyone to stay safe and eat your, eat your greens and um, watch my video on boosting your immune system that, that I did and uh, just stay safe and hope to see you all on uh, next week's class. Thank you so much again for, for everything. Really do appreciate your attendance. Good night. I uh, just wanna make sure that, uh, yeah, we are recording, great. Okay, great, have a great night.